As Chancellor Demir likes to say, this is indeed our finest hour. Is it? <laughs>Welcome back. I am Adri Corti. The goal of my YouTube channel is to make academia entertaining and accessible for you. So if that sounds good, please make sure to subscribe. I want to be able to grow this channel as much as I can. So please take a second and go ahead and subscribe. So today I have the pleasure of talking about this book for the very last time, <laughs> which I am very excited about. A year like no other. Today I'll be talking about part three and uh, the epilogue. Go check out part one and part two of me talking about this book. This book was sent out by Vanderbilt to everyone at Vanderbilt to sort of wrap up and summarize what Vanderbilt did during the pandemic, you know, in the vaccine development and um, bringing students back to campus and things like that. And so if you watch my other videos, you will see that this book is very propagandist and um, just strange. <laughs> so I'm going to do this how I usually do this by starting with a disclaimer that I work at Vanderbilt. They pay my bills. So it's not my intention to just shit all over Vanderbilt. That's not why I started reading this book. Um, I read it because I heard so many things from people at Vanderbilt expressing their distaste for this book. So I got really curious about it and decided to read it. I wanted to make uh, videos about it because it's actually pretty entertaining. So. And like I always do in these videos, I'm going to start with positive comments and then transition into negative comments to try to have a really balanced review of the book. So in today's video, there will be multiple sections I'll be talking about in the negative section. So I'm going to talk about mental health. I'm going to talk about how the book describes students returning to campus, uh, specifically, you know, sports and fraternities. I'm going to talk about how this book talks about policing. I'm going to have a really short section where they talk about money. Then I'm going to talk about the silly stuff, the stuff that made me laugh. And then we're just going to end it. We're going to read the ending of this book. And then I'll also end this series of videos. Okay, so let's dive in. Part three is called Stepping Up. I actually have a PDF of the book. So I've been able to do a lot of control F and see how many times they mention things. If you don't know what control F is, that's just a shortcut you can use in any document to look up a certain word or phrase. And then it basically tells you the number of times that word or phrase is said within the document. I actually looked up step up in the book and they only say it like nine times. I was expecting they were gonna say it a hundred times, um, but it just felt like they said it a hundred times because anytime there's like pushback towards Vanderbilt being like, you know, we don't feel safe here. Maybe you shouldn't bring students back or any sort of issue. They're just like, y'all need to step up. But they actually only said it nine times. So I guess it just felt like a lot more. This is supposed to be the positive part. So I need to stop talking shit for a second. And this is going to be a mix of part three and the epilogue. And again, I'll put like references that I say or articles down below for you to look at and also page numbers and references at the bottom of the screen. So if you don't believe me, go check the book out. Check for yourself. So in the beginning of the book, part one, they talk about vaccine development at Vanderbilt. We had some pretty big players within the vaccine development. And then at the very end of the book, they talk about how um, finally at the Vanderbilt University Medical Center, the COVID-19 vaccine is being administered to the people working within the medical center. So that was a really nice sandwich. I thought you begin the book with vaccine development and you end the book with people actually taking the vaccine in the medical center, which is really really cool. Um, they also do try to talk more about the DEI efforts. I talked about that more in part two and my main takeaway was that they talk a lot about interventions they make without referencing any outcomes. So here I will say they sort of try to make an effort to talk more about what they actually did on campus for DEI efforts, which is diversity, equity, and inclusion. They make basically this document of recommendations for DEI stuff at Vanderbilt, and they share it with the university. They say it ends up being like a 500 page report of like best practices, like best DEI practices. When they say, you know, there's this 500 page document, why not just reference 
it so we can go and look as readers at what the document said. Again, this just seems sort of like if this document exists and you guys spent all these time and resources to make it, you should publicize it more. You know, in this book, why not have a reference to go look at it? They also talk about Sarah Fuller. I hope I'm saying her last name right, but basically during COVID, one of the, they call the football teams like kicking specialist um, had COVID. So they weren't able to play in a football game. And so to basically fix this problem, the football coach at the time, Derek Mason decided, well, why don't we get somebody from the soccer team and actually the women's soccer team. So he ended up asking the women's Vanderbilt uh, soccer goalkeeper, Sarah Fuller, to um, basically kick during the football game. First woman to play football in the NCAA Power Five Conference. Uh, that was a cool story that I'm glad that they included in the book. And it was neat to see sort of how that actually ended up happening. The last positive thing I'll say is that they do mention the Capitol riots of like January 6th. They describe them as being a violent mob of right wing extremists, conspiracy theorists, white supremacists, and others loyal to President Donald Trump. And I was happy to see them actually describe them that way. It is such a small win <laughs> in the context of this book that they're actually calling white supremacists white supremacists. Like, thank you for doing it this one time. So I will put that in the positive section. Um, but it is sort of like the bar is low for positive comments for this book now because they released a document talking about George Floyd's death. Um, Vanderbilt did and they basically the takeaway was that all lives are valuable. They actually wrote those words. They kind of take a, in my opinion, a centrist tone to where it wouldn't upset people on the right. I imagine that's because they must have investors and alumni that are on the right and they don't want to upset them. I don't have any evidence to support that, but that is what I think of why they speak like this. Now we're going to get into the negative comments first talking about mental health. The reason I want to talk about mental health is because there has been a lot of talk at Vanderbilt recently, specifically among graduate students about how Vanderbilt is handling mental health. They do have a lot of resources, but it's becoming more apparent that the resources they provide are not enough for the amount of graduate students that require some mental health resources. You know, there's hundreds of graduate students and I think there's just a few counselors at the counseling center. So I've heard that there's long wait times. People just aren't getting the resources that they need in a timely manner. And so I wanted to go through and I looked via control F in the book PDF for the words mental health. And it actually only came up four times. And so I went through each time and I just wanted to look like what was the context of how they were talking about mental health. Okay, so the first time they bring up mental health, I think I mentioned this in part one, is this lady who's the director of digital strategies, Lacey Pascal, talking about that she works so much that she couldn't even go outside for a walk for mental health. So second time they bring up mental health. So it's like this group of people discussing how um, programming and community gatherings could translate to a virtual format. So this is in the section where they're talking about how are we gonna bring students back to campus. They say they discussed how to address students' mental health concerns. A big part of the responsibilities of the Office of Housing and Residential Experience. So they're like, we are discussing how to address students' mental health, but again, they don't talk about anything that they actually did. The third time, it's when this guy is talking about creating the campaign of like, it's like the public health campaign of the squirrels wearing masks to like encourage people to wear masks. And he's like, animals are a great proxy for conveying difficult things like mental health. The fourth time is they're talking about resident assistances or RAs, which if you're not familiar, these are like undergrads and I think sometimes graduate students who live in the dorms and it's sort of like uh, they support the students and they're like, it was an important job for the RAs to keep an eye on residents' mental health. The, the, these are the only times they bring up mental health. One of them is an employee talking about she can't get any breaks. Another one is just talking about how we understand students have mental health issues that's it. Another time is just talking about how like it's sometimes nice to use animals as a proxy to talk about mental health, which is actually not what even that campaign 
did. And then the last time is just like the RAs, which are just student positions, really need to pay attention to the student's mental health. So they're basically, in my opinion, putting a lot of the responsibility for the students' mental health on other students. There's all of these things that happen at Vanderbilt and have happened that you can go see in the article I'll link below that is just really precipitating a conversation about Vanderbilt's handling mental health and it's not going super well. And then they, they have this whole book during COVID. This would have been a nice opportunity for them to talk about mental health interventions that they did, but instead they're just like, these are the only times they bring up mental health in the whole book. So that is disappointing. But now we'll get into how they talk about students returning to campus. This semester, August to December 2020, in early August, other schools that were offering in-person classes, the students there were having these parties um, and going to bars off campus. It like spiked up the infection rates at these colleges. They were forced to move their classes online. Daniel, Demir, and then Susan Went are like, we need to tell students that this is not acceptable. So they end up posting a message on Instagram, but they're basically like all of like the parties and disregard for face mask will not be tolerated at Vanderbilt. But then the last part is like all students should know that flouting public health requirements in Nashville doesn't just result in student conduct violations. It can carry real criminal penalties. And then it's like we write this not to scare you, but, but to be perfectly plain, the situation happening at other universities can be avoided at Vanderbilt, but only if you anchor down, step up, and do your part. It's scary. The tone is really scary, and they're like, it can carry real criminal penalties. And they post it on Instagram, which is like such a public place to post it. I wonder why they didn't just send it out in an email. Okay, in my opinion, I think they did this because they knew that there were going to be positive cases that came from students partying like that is sort of just that's going to happen so i think they were like this is definitely going to happen instead of not letting students come back at all to avoid this we are of course going to let them come back so that we can make money but we need to let everybody know that we're really stern about this so when this inevitably happens we can go back to this very public post and be like we told y'all not to so really has nothing to do with us. Because this was a time where they could have just let students not come back because they saw what was happening at other universities. So that's my opinion of why they put that on Instagram. <laughs> okay, and so then after they talk about that scary thing they put on Instagram, Demir is like, it was like mom and dad laying down the law. Like talking about him and Suzanne Went. When I read that part, I was like, why are they saying it like that? That's so creepy. But it was actually a way for them to segue into the next part where they're like, the university's gathering policy was eliciting objections from actual students, real moms and dads. Um, so this is a way to segue into shitting on the parents at Vanderbilt, which they like to do. See part two if you want to know what I'm talking about. So Suzanne Wynn is trying to like summarize what's being said on like a Vanderbilt parents Facebook page. And she's like in quotations, why don't you let them have social gatherings? Why are you cracking down on parties off campus? So she's remembering this. And then Suzanne is like, just baffles me as a parent myself. It's almost like they were giving their kids permission to get COVID or something. And we wrote them, we told them we needed them to step up. Again, the way Suzanne talks about people's parents is so rude in this entire book. But basically I think here with her saying that thing about the Vanderbilt parents Facebook page, I don't think that was a representative of how all parents were feeling at Vanderbilt. Second thing is there are no there are no screenshots. Did that even happen? Like it literally could have been one parent out of a thousand that said that and then she decides to put this antidote in the book. I doubt that this is representative and you don't have any evidence that this was representative. And then you're basically being like, as a parent myself, I would never make such a dumb statement. Like just propping herself up. Let's say for just argument's sake, that thousands of Vanderbilt parents were on that Facebook group being like, let our kids party. And then her response to that is y'all need to step up. Again, that is not an all encompassing argument for everything. Like anytime there's backlash, she's just like, y'all really should step up. Like, thank you. <laughs>
And you know, even if the parents were saying this, this might be an opportunity for you to be empathetic towards them, to show that you understand where they're coming from, but this is what public health precautions are saying we should do now. We're just following this for the safety of your children. But we understand where you're coming from. You want your children to have a good quality of life. Like these are things she could have said from an empathetic standpoint, but instead she says, we told them to step up. Like, step up, bitch. This book goes into what tracing is a little bit. So they were like, at other schools, the length of time between a student getting a positive test and getting a call from a contact tracer could be like five days. But at Vanderbilt, um, it was like within 24 hours. That's really the only time they talk about how they do it. But my understanding is like when you test positive, those teams of people that will call you, figure out who you were with and where you were. And this is how you can get data for sort of, where are the hubs for infection? That's why we shouldn't go to bars and that's why we shouldn't go to clubs because probably from the data, from the contact tracing data, these are like hubs of infection. I will say the tracing system at Vanderbilt did seem very efficient. They they say no positive case at Vanderbilt was due to being in the classroom or in the lab or on the sports field. Is that true? I mean, that's impressive if that is true, but I have no idea because they did not release the tracing data. We have to take their word for it that no case ever came from being on Vanderbilt's campus. Like that's the main takeaway at this point was they're like, it was a win. Like we really handled COVID because all of the students who got COVID, it wasn't from being at Vanderbilt. They talk about myocarditis, which is an inflammation of the heart that can weaken it and lead to more significant health issues. So this can happen um, when you have COVID-19. And apparently it's a big concern among collegiate athletes, by mid-February 2021, a total of 138 Vanderbilt student athletes had tested positive for COVID since they started testing in August 2020, and then six developed myocarditis. This reference goes to a New York Times article about Demi Washington, who was a female basketball player, and it's this whole story about how she got it. It was really hard for her health, like she couldn't play anymore. She was bedridden, it was really bad. But then she did recover, which is great. But out of the six, I assume Demi is one. They don't talk about the other five at all, like what happened to them or who they were. Like they just bring it up. They're like six got this really terrible side effect from COVID-19. One of them got better. Bye. Like what happened to the other five? That's really, that's really bad. And I can't find anywhere what happened to the other five students. Like, are they okay? Could they ever play again? The mission was for Vanderbilt to bring students back, but to not let any of them get COVID from being at Vanderbilt. But they did still get COVID. Like many people still got COVID, but they're saying it's a win because they never traced it to being from Vanderbilt's campus. I find that hard to believe. I find that hard to believe. And even if it is true, so weird that that's still a win. People really got sick. People got myocarditis. That's a win? They talk so much about the rules for housing. They have like so many pages and so many details about like students who are gonna be living in dorms. Maybe too many details, honestly. It was pretty dry, but they don't talk about fraternity rules or sorority rules. They're talking about several fraternities like around the country and other colleges and they're like, a number of universities had to reverse plans to offer in-person classes because the fraternities had so many outbreaks. So they reference this in the book and they're like, you know, shame on them sort of thing. We decided to go forward. We weren't going to have that problem. 30 pages later, we're talking about COVID cases. There was an uptick after the first full week students were back on campus, stemming from several small clusters of infections among lacrosse players, football players, and members of the Sigma Chi fraternity. This accounted for nearly 60% of the positive cases. <laughs> but then they're like, all the infections were originating off campus and in homes with three or more bedrooms. Seems to me that you didn't really have rules for fraternities or sorority housing, that because they probably pay so much and bring money into the university, that they didn't have rules for them. They certainly didn't report it in this book in this section about rules for housing. And then there was all of these cases when they say it's only if you live in a house with three or more rooms. 
which to me sounds like they're describing a frat house. I'm going to talk about how they talk about policing in part three and in the epilogue. <laughs> I have been waiting for this one, y'all. They're like, off campus, the university also employed knock and talks at student residences to encourage them to follow guidelines, in quotation, and frankly, to signal that we knew where they lived. Knock and talks, y'all. <laughs> They were randomly, uninvited, without warning, going to people's residences off campus. How fucking crazy would it be if like the actual police were like, you know, they do the no knock warrants and they started calling them no knock and talks. Ah, oh, it's very just. Oh. And then they talk about the, the National Christmas Day bomber, which was in... I guess December 2020, this guy had an RV parked in downtown Nashville. On Christmas morning, there was like this alarm that went off from the RV that was like, get out of your houses now, a bomb is about to go off. And that's exactly what happened. A bomb went off downtown from the RV and it caused all of this damage. It like took down AT&T network hubs which like turned off like people's phone and internet for for thousands of people like throughout Tennessee, like in several states. Like it was a really big deal. It caused thousands of dollars in damage, um, but no one was killed or anything. But basically in this book, they're like, thanks largely to the rapid evacuation of residents by Nashville police, no one other than the bomber was killed. So when this happened, everyone was like, thank you, thank you, thank you to the police that evacuated people. It was like, really a time people posting on instagram pictures of the cops like thank you so much for your service we love you so much whatever that is cool that they save you know they got people out of their apartments that's awesome but what is not mentioned here is that 16 months before the bomb goes off on christmas day the guy who made the bomb his girlfriend called the police 16 months before okay and it's like hey y'all he is making bombs in the rv like, here's our address. Here's what he's doing. It's in the RV. She gives him all the information. <laughs> and so I go to this article that talks about this. And then they, they are basically like, the police is, this is how they describe what happened. They get the call from the girlfriend, okay? They go over to the guy's house. They see the RV parked at the house. And then they just knock. They're like, hey, can we come in? No one answers. <laughs> okay, we'll go home. Sorry to bother you. We maybe could have done a no knock and talk. I don't know. <laughs> but they they see the RV. They, the guy doesn't answer, so they just leave. And then they're like, from just looking at the RV, they can't tell if anything illegal is going on inside. <laughs> the bombs are not outside of the vehicle. They're inside. So they're like, end of investigation. They're literally like, they call him a few times. He never answers. They, they don't talk to him. They look into his background. He doesn't have any priors. They're like, he's clean. All right, that's it. That's it, y'all. That was their investigation. They never went into the RV. They had 16 months to deal with this before this man destroyed a giant part of the city. Thousands of dollars in damage, almost killed people. That's all they did. It's so crazy to me that you see cops going to people's houses and having these no knock warrants for seamlessly very strange things. Like we heard a drug deal was happening 18 blocks away. So we're doing a no knock warrant at your house, killing people in their homes, like not being held responsible for that. But then someone calls and is like, this person is making a bomb at this address in this car. They cannot find a way to legally search the vehicle. What? They had 16 months to deal with this. Whatever. I'm done bitching about this. But I'm just saying that, like, that's not mentioned in the book. They're just like, there is this bomber and the cops really save the day. Did they? I'm not saying the cops that saved the people that day had anything to do with the investigation. Great. Give them props. You can give them props while simultaneously also talking about how this was because of the cops failure that this happened in the first place. If you're going to publish this book, do your research before you just spew stuff. Like that's the main takeaway for this entire book. They talk about money a little bit. The very last pages, they're like, the endowment is now 8 billion. It actually did grow. It's so weird because in the book they have complained about the endowment is going to shrink. We need to tighten our belts. But then in the same book, they're like, it actually, the endowment grew, sweet. Like 
Why even talk about that first part then, being like, we are so scared the endowment is gonna shrink, when you know it didn't. They never talk about, the graduate student union um, was a big reason why graduate students are getting even a raise this year. Like it was pretty clear that we were not gonna be getting a raise. They petitioned and fought for it and now we are getting a raise. Like that's not put in here at all. That is a win, that's a Vanderbilt win. Like a, a cohort of people at Vanderbilt saw a problem, came together, petitioned and made it right. That's a win. That should be something that is highlighted and bragged about. It's not brought up in the book. At one point they mentioned putting fertilizer on the grass. <laughs> the bar for putting stuff in this book is low and they, they miss out on so many interesting things that actually happened. So now we're getting to my favorite part of all these videos, the very silly parts that are just so strange. So at one point they're talking about in the dorm rooms, people like need to work out, but you know, like the gym is closed. So a lot of people bought these pull up bars to put in their doorways to like do pull ups and things like that. Okay, but then they're like, some days the hallway would be lined with students hanging from bars, straining, sweating, and screaming. <laughs> Thank you for that imagery. Like, thank you so much. <laughs> Why is that in the book? <laughs> Why did you describe it like that? Okay, and the last silly thing. They're talking about a virtual town hall, which is like on Zoom. They have like administrative university officials talk to students about various things. So like in a virtual town hall for students and their families, university officials describe Vanderbilt undergraduates as the best spitters in the country. Cause they're like referencing how like they have all this testing and stuff, mandatory testing twice a week and that the testing was like you go spit into like a little tube, but they call them the best spitters in the country. <laughs> okay, that's even fun if they said it in the virtual hall and then later they're like, maybe we shouldn't have said that, it's kind of weird. They felt so comfortable about this, they put it in the book. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, 30 years from now, when people read this book and see, you know, what Vanderbilt did, we want them to know that we called undergraduates the best spitters in the country. <laughs> yeah, I love this book. I love this book so much. It's my favorite book. <laughs> and now, what we have all been waiting for is the end of this book. Yes, I'm so excited. Okay, this is it, y'all. I've talked about this book for so long. So at the end of the book, they're like, we need to talk about the reasons why we decided to publish this book while COVID was still going on. When they published this, the pandemic was not over. At this point, the pandemic's barely even over, you know? Like, so they're like, we should probably give people a reason. They're gonna ask, like, why didn't you wait? Oh my God. This is the big reason, y'all. Get ready. As with the 1918 flu pandemic, the Great Depression, both world wars, Vietnam, or the civil rights era, it was critical to record Vanderbilt's place in this indelible history and to do so in real time, not by examining this experience through the distorting lens of hindsight years from now. The distorting lens of hindsight years from now. Have y'all ever heard someone say that? You know how people talk about hindsight is 2020, like hindsight gives you so much perspective about things. Like if you could make decisions knowing the outcomes, like that's hindsight, like you would, but they're saying that hindsight is a distorting lens. <laughs> that's the reason they give for writing the book during the pandemic before it was over. I'm trying to think of the words for why this is so crazy, but I can't even put it into words. It's just, it's just a crazy thing to say. Also, when they're talking about like the flu pandemic, the Great Depression, the world wars in Vietnam and stuff and the civil rights movement, my understanding was that there's, you know, there's probably a lot of literature from those times, but there's also a, lit a lot of literature from after those times talking about what happened. And I, I can't compare either of those. Like, is it better to write history while it's happening or after it's happened? I would argue probably after it's happened. Like, yeah, you know, write it all down while it's happening. Give yourself some time to think about it, to get more of the context of just the history that's going on, you know, the whole time period, and then write something about that whole time period. Because you know that literature would just be more encompassing, you'd have a better perspective, 
right? Let me know down below what you think of the phrase distorting lens of hindsight means because to me it feels nonsensical. And then the very last sentence in this book, as Chancellor Demure likes to say, this is indeed our finest hour. Is it? <laughs> That's it. This book has a propagandist tone and all they do is talk about positive interventions without ever talking about any of the outcomes. It also is very centrist. They say things in a way to, in my opinion, not insult people on the right. Do I think they should have written this book at all? Maybe 10 years from now, five years from now. I think this book would have been really cool if they would have gotten more opinions. They have some like opinions from students in there. I would have liked to hear from graduate students, some perspective about mental health, about having to be the first ones to return to campus and work in labs being test cases, see part two for when they said that, for how the safety precautions were actually gonna go. I would have liked to see that. I would have loved to see some references to data for all the interventions they talk about. This could have been a really neat project and it, 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 I think it was a failure, honestly. That's it, that's all I have to say about this book. Comment down below your thoughts. If you have any other books that I should review, because as painful as this was, it was also pretty entertaining. So I'm definitely down to review some more books. Stay tuned, I'm gonna be making a video about mental health at Vanderbilt and in graduate school in general. So you definitely want to subscribe and stay tuned for upcoming content. Subscribing really helps me grow the channel. I want to turn this into my job one day. So you subscribing really helps. And thank you for watching and I will see you guys next time.